Hello, I'm not Chuck. Aiming a TV antenna at a distant television station can be a really time-consuming process. And the farther away from home you get, the more difficult it becomes. If you're an RVer boondocking in unfamiliar territory, it can seem like it takes forever. Believe me, I know firsthand. And the instructions provided by antenna manufacturers don't help very much. About all they tell you is the same trial and error process that's already failed. Yes, I know there are apps for your phone that are supposed to help. If you have one and it's up to date and you know how to use it, maybe it'll work. But for me, they're more trouble than they're worth. In this video, I'm going to present a way to maximize your chances of getting the station you want on the very first try. It doesn't require a cell phone or a GPS. You will need to know where you are, where the television station transmitter is located, and the bearing from you to the transmitter. I'll help you get that information. You'll need a compass, a map, a wooden pencil, and a little guidance. I'll provide the guidance. Believe me, once you try it, you'll realize how easy it really is, and you'll wonder why anyone does it any other way. Here are six examples of OTA, RV, TV antennas. How's that for a lot of abbreviations? RV and TV, I'm sure you know. OTA stands for over the air. That means as opposed to cable or satellite signals, these antennas are for receiving signals over the air, straight from the transmitter of the television station in question. I remember the days, of course, when all TV signals were over the air. People in cities got good pictures, but those of us in the fringe areas got a lot of snow in the video and static in the audio. We did a lot of antenna turning to try to see the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. These are two examples of omnidirectional antennas for RV television. Some people call them non-directional because of their relatively short range. What omnidirectional really means is that they receive equally well in every direction all the way around. So that means in their design there's no discernible front or back because these antennas don't have to be aimed. Here are four examples of directional antennas. The first one, the Sensar 3, is a bi-directional antenna. That means it receives as well from the back as it does from the front. The back being parallel to that element that's going crossways in the picture. But it doesn't receive very well off of each end of the element. It's bi-directional. The one just below it is a Sensor 4 and it has what's called a wingman attached to it. See that little piece sticking out sort of up and to the left? That's the wingman, and that makes it a unidirectional antenna. The smaller end is the front, and that's the way the antenna should be pointed toward the television station. The one at the top right is the Razor Z1, which is the one that I just recently put on my travel trailer. It is also a unidirectional antenna, and the small end there, again, is the front. That is the end that's pointing down and to the left. The one below it is a competitor to the Razor Z1. It's called a King Jack. Uh, some people think it's better than the Razor Z1. Some people think the Razor Z1 is better. I frankly don't know. What I do know is this, that all four of these antennas are in one way or another related to a Yagi, Y-A-G-I, design of antenna. If you want to know more about Yagis, you can Google it and there'll be plenty of information on the web. As I told you, this process requires both a compass and a map. I'll be using a Silva, fairly inexpensive compass. It does have two features that are important to the process. The first is a clear bottom so that we'll be able to look through the compass and see the map underneath. And the second is a rotatable bezel. We'll be using that particular feature as well. This is a map of Wyoming, and it's the map that I'll be using in the antenna aiming exercise. As you can probably see, it's a page that I 
cut from my 2004 Rand McNally Road Atlas. You might wonder why I did that. I did it because I didn't want to cut a page from my 2019 Rand McNally Road Atlas. The map is pretty ordinary. It has, of course, the map of Wyoming. In addition, it has down here a map of the two largest cities in Wyoming, Cheyenne and Casper. And it also has a map of Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. Might come in handy. The other thing I want to point out to you is right here. This is the north marker. It indicates that straight up on the map is due north. Be sure and keep that in mind. It's very important. Now, there's also one other detail on the map that I want to show you, and I have to rotate the map and then zoom in on it. So, give me a minute to uh, get set up. This is a distance scale, and the length of this line represents 30 miles on the map. If we measure that line, we see that it is 20 millimeters long. So, 20 millimeters measured on the map represents 30 miles in the real world. So if 20 millimeters represents 30 miles, how far does one millimeter represent? And of course the answer is one and a half miles. Please try to keep that in mind as well. Let's play a little game of make-believe. Let's pretend that you and your significant other are taking your RV and you're heading across the state of Wyoming. You just came up from Denver, you went through Cheyenne on Interstate 25, kept following it around till you got to Casper, Wyoming, and you've stopped to take a little break and maybe plan the rest of your trip. You could go up to Yellowstone, you might go to uh, the Grand Tetons, you might decide, well, let's just go on over to Jackson, Wyoming. You don't know, you're living free, so you can decide and change your mind anytime you get ready. But you do decide, because you've heard some good things about Riverton, Wyoming, you're going to head for Riverton today. You've decided that you're going to take this highway, which is sort of a combination of Highway 20 and 26. You're going to follow it along this way and then drop down and go to Riverton. So you're driving along and there's not a lot to see, frankly, along that highway. A lot of antelope and some tiny little towns. And your significant other says, you know, honey, it's getting late and we were going to watch you pick a television program tonight. And I'm getting tired and what do you say let's stop for the night somewhere along the way? And of course you say, Sure, baby, whatever you want. And you see a sign as you're coming up on Waltman, Wyoming, about a rest stop ahead. So you decide, we'll pull over at the rest stop. And you get there, and sure enough, it's a nice-looking rest stop. So you pull in, and what do you know? A great spot, and you park. After leveling the rig, you find out that the television program that your significant other wants to watch is only available on a station whose transmitter is located in Rock Springs, Wyoming. You take a quick look at the map and realize that Rock Springs is quite a ways. What should I do to optimize my chances of being able to receive that station? Of course the idea of receiving a usable television signal from a transmitter 140 or so miles away on an RV antenna is pretty unlikely. But hey, we're playing make-believe, so let's take our best shot. Here's what I would do. I know that the RV is parked in level, so my next step would be to place my map on a nice flat level surface inside the RV. I would try to find my compass and rotate the bezel so that the end on the bezel is pointed up 
in line with this white mark. Then I would position my compass over the north indicator on the map, making sure that the red arrow on the clear plastic is perfectly aligned with the north indicator. Then I would slowly rotate the map and the compass, trying to not disturb the position of the map on the compass. I would rotate both of them simultaneously until the red end of the needle on the compass was pointing directly at the end on the bezel. At that point, I would know that both the top of the map and the compass were pointing at magnetic north. As I continued to use the map, I would try to maintain this angle in relation to the front edge of my work surface, making sure to maintain this angle will ensure that as long as the red end of the needle continues to point at the letter N, both the map and the compass will be pointed at magnetic north, and I may take bearing readings by reading them directly from the bezel on the compass. Let me demonstrate. I am maintaining the angle here with respect to the front of the work surface and I have taped the map in place on both sides so that it will not shift. Now if I take the compass and place the center of the compass over the rest area at Waltman, rotate the compass until the red end of the needle is pointing directly at the end on the bezel, then I may take a reading by placing a straight edge, such as this pencil, across the center of the compass so that I am now pointing directly from Waltman to Rock Springs. And when I look at the bezel of the compass, I see that the bearing is 230 degrees. So if I take my compass outside, ensure that my RV antenna is also pointing at a bearing of 230 degrees, I can be assured that my antenna is indeed pointing from Waltman to Rock Springs. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you learned something useful, and if you did, you'll give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and tell your friends. And as usual, don't forget, I'm not Chuck.